we are finishing a series in John, and this series has been all about this question, why does John only choose these eight miracles put in his particular gospel? So if you have your Bibles, open up to John. We are on miracle seven, and we're going to hit eight as well. But miracle seven is Lazarus rising from the dead. Spoiler alert, in case you didn't know how that, that story ended, but... And we kind of go through each one of these and we're, we're trying to figure out why would John only pick these eight? He ends the book by saying Jesus did many other things as well. So he got bored. He got so bored from all the signs that Jesus was doing that he's like, I couldn't even fill up all the books in the world. Or I, I, however that's written over there. Um, I couldn't even put all of the things that Jesus did in, in all the books of the world. Now that is interesting. And so he chooses eight. Even Matthew had 22. So why these eight? What is he getting at? He started with water into wine. Now, if you remember back this message, this is the wedding groom preparing everything. The entire village would come to this party. Each time you had one of these weddings, it was like the party of the century. And they were celebrating, he, they're rejoicing, they're going all out. He has his bride, he's prepared everything in advance. He's ready to share his love and move to this next level. Now, what if after all of that, the wine runs out? All this pomp and circumstance, all this preparation, and he doesn't prepare for this incredible moment with his bride. What would that say to all the people? What would that say to his new bride? It would have been this dramatic message of unworthiness. Do you think that Jesus may have wanted to show us something pretty spectacular with this first miracle. This first miracle where he has all of this bride analogy and all through the Bible, all these analogies about how important the bride is, his church, his people, you guys, us, how important we are, that he would want to say in this first miracle, this day, this special day is coming and there is nothing that has not been prepared for you. I have gone and prepared a home. I'm coming back with the angels. It's going to be spectacular. And I have, I have everything prepared for this moment. Now to the outside observer, they would look at this and they would go, the first miracle, that should have been the blind guy. You know, that should have been the one raising it, the dead, like some spectacular, really important, magnificent moment. But what our God says, what Jesus says, is you are truly magnificent and not my bride. This first miracle is him saying, I love you and nothing's going to stop our moment together. Then we got to the second miracle. This was the royal official's son being healed. This is when Jesus is in Galilee, uh, his hometown. That's what's so important about this one. This is where Nazareth is. He was born there. The people should have known him. But what does he say about this particular area? A prophet has no honor in his own country. His words weren't enough there. What did they know about him? He was the water into wine guy. Cana is in Galilee, so it's the same area. He was the one that took the whip and whipped all the Jews. And so when they see Jesus, they're like, oh, cool, another miracle. They're excited. You know, miracle God, miracle Jesus is showing up. Let's see what he does next. It's the magic show. That's what they're excited about. So we're being set up with a second miracle in a way that says, what exactly is your faith? Do you have a Samaritan faith? And we had that whole, the woman at the well story and the Samaritans. It's all about this movement to his words were enough. I don't need the miracles. Your words are enough. Or do you have Galilean faith? I have to see a miracle. Most in our world, we have this phrase, seeing is believing. I mean, we want to see it before we're going to believe. And I'm the same way. I want to see it too. I want to see a miracle of God every day. I get it. We totally get this. We understand this. The problem is, sometimes he gives us those miracles, and sometimes he doesn't. So how is your faith going to move through this in and out of sometimes he's answering, sometimes he's not? 
What we become is blown back and forth by the wind. Suddenly, our faith, sometimes we're all in, sometimes we're out. We keep going back and forth, and we're like, why can't I just be all in? And it's because our faith hasn't moved to this level that his words are enough. So he comes with this second miracle and says, I love you. I love you, and I want you to have a faith that goes beyond sight. Do you hear it? His love for you wants to take you to a new level with him. Then we get to sign three. The man with the mat waiting for a miracle by the pool. He's sitting here, and we live in a world like this where traditions kind of overtake everyone. We have all these, these interesting faith things going on. We have a horoscope. We have psychics. We have magic cards. We have false religions. We have... Everybody is following something. In fact, if you're in this room or you're watching online, you go, no, I don't follow anything. I do things my own way. And what you're following is yourself. You are the God in your universe. You believe that you you are the, the center of the world. You do. Everyone has something that they follow. And then when you approach them with this message of Jesus, most stay in what they know. Even if it's painful, even if nothing has changed in their life, they still understand it. They understand this pain. They understand the loneliness. And Jesus, God, you want to be whole. I love you. I have so much more for you. Do you want to be made whole? The enemy wants you to stay miserable. The enemy wants you to complain and find a group that, that affirms you in your beliefs that affirms you in all of your complaining and your feelings about the world and this and that. And you get that little group, that tight group around you that believes like you do. The enemy wants you to stay in that spot when God wants you to know real freedom. He wants you to get up, take your mat, and walk to real freedom in this world. And the invalid responds with telling Jesus, why he can't be healed. He tells Jesus, the miracle, the God, the one, the healer that's standing in front of him, the healer is standing in front of him saying, do you want to be made whole? And his answer is, well, let me tell you why I can't be. And that miracle is to show us he's so much more and that he loves you and he wants you to move to a new freedom then we get to the miracle of, of uh, feeding the 5,000. We're at miracle four. I'm sure you were all at these sermons, so this is all just ringing bells, right? Do you believe in God's uber mega power within you? That was miracle four. Him and you are unstoppable. You remember the Michael Jordan thing? We have six championships between the two of us. Him and your little, as you offer it up, you're unstoppable. How are you doing with God's blessings in your life? He has blessed you. And so with that blessing, with that little, as you offer it up to him, you become unstoppable. And what he's saying is, I love you. I love you and I'm going to move through you with that little that you have. I'm going to do so much more. Miracle 5 was all about our purpose. When Jesus walks on water, you may be living in the miracle. You may be actually feeling like I'm stepping out and walking on water. You're seeing God move through you. You're excited. And then a little bit of doubt creeps in and you start to sink. And you're like, God, I was all in. What happened? Just a little bit of doubt. And we started to fall. And he immediately catches us. Some of us are in that moment. You're sinking even though you're all in. Some of you are still in the boat, but you're ready. You want to take that step of faith. And some of you, you're nowhere near any of that. You're sinking and you just need a savior. Whatever the case is, that miracle is going back to your purpose. Why are you here? God has created you for purpose. I love the church because purpose comes out of the church all the time. You're always getting to use your purpose in some way as you're involved in the ecclesia, the church that we are. And God says, I have created you for purpose because I love you. And I'm immediately going to grab you as you continue to step out in faith. So step out in faith. Miracle six is the healing of the blind man. 
Can we get past blindness to receive sight? This is last week. The blindness of doubt, uncertainty, confusion, you know, that feeling of, is this life really about being born so that we can go to school for way too long and then we're in school to what? Get a great job? And that great job allows us to buy a home so that we can get married and have kids, get to have grandkids, and that's what it was all about. And then we're buried in a box. Is that what it is? Is that, this, is that the goal? And so there's this thought in your head like, that can't, there has to be more than that, right? And so we start to believe Maybe it is God, except that there's a God. Why in the world is there so much pain and sorrow and this world is full of terrible people who are mean and, and what, like those two, how would God allow this? And these two things are warring in your head and we're blind constantly by it. Like which one is going to win? And in that miracle, he says, I once was blind, but I met Jesus. And now I can see. Are you at a point where you have met Jesus? You have fallen in love with Jesus. You have seen his love for you that says, I have so much more for you. Now go and move with sight. Are you ready to receive sight? As we have explored each one of these, we have, all, we have found that they all point to this greater message that you have a God that loves you. Over and over John points you to this God that loves you. He sent his son Jesus because he loves you. Jesus did these miracles to show you a deeper and more important side of who God is. And then ultimately in miracle eight, as he dies and he rises again, it's going to be that ultimate action of love that he loves you and wants you to be with him for eternity. So in Miracle 7, we have John, the writer, chapter 11. Chapter 11 begins, verse 1 and 2, and immediately John jumps to foreshadow in chapter 12. Why does he do this? It's a weird way to write. He's writing in a way that he's automatically jumping to the next chapter and telling you about what happens at the end of the story while he's in the midst of the story in chapter 11. So what does he jump to? It's chapter 12, 1 through 3. It says this, six days before the Passover, and you'll notice John talks about the Passover constantly because it's the point. Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Now here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, pours it on Jesus' feet, wipes his feet with her hair, and the house is filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Why is John foreshadowing to this event? Because it's the point. It's the point of the story. They had discovered who Jesus was and how much he loves them. And so what do they do with the rest of their life? They have an expression of love back to him. She's giving that year's wages of perfume, dumping it on his feet. They're sitting together. They're, they're with their God in this moment of love. Why? Because they've discovered how much he loves them. When we discover how much he loves us, our life will begin showing love back to him. Catch this, church. There's four different people in this story, and you have to understand each one. The first is Martha. Martha is the doer. How many doers do we have in here? The doer is this. The doer is the one that gets things done. You not only you know, have the party, but you clean the house, you cook the meal, you serve, you clean the house after. You know, when you have a serving event, you're the doer of that event. Any doers in here? A few of you? Yeah, I love Martha. Martha's me. I love Martha. The doer in the story says, if only. She runs to the gate, talks to Jesus and says, if only you had been here, Jesus, Lazarus would be alive. See, doers love time travel. 
I know this because I'm a doer and I'm the worst at it. I'm always going, oh, if only I had said it this way. If only I'm like playing out the day, I'm playing out the week. Sometimes I'm going back into high school, you know, just a few years ago, like 10 years ago. <laughs> if only, and I'm, and this is how, this is really stupid. I'm thinking if only I had just kind of done this, if only I had not done this, there would be some just, we're always doing that, and it's just so weird that we're, we're replaying these moments saying, if only, and we do it with God all the time. Doers do this with God. If only you had done this, if only you had, had done this miracle, if only you had, had not done this, that's how we constantly talk. And the question that you will need to ask yourself today is can you praise God no matter what he does? Can you praise God if he's not answering prayers the way you think he should? If he's not playing out the story the way that you would expect the story to be played out? Can you praise God for not what he does, but for who he is? That's what the doer has to move to. Then we have Mary. Mary's the listener. She's the quiet one. Any Marys in here? Like to just be at the feet of Jesus? I mean, that's what we want to be, right? The doers are like, yeah, I wish. <laughs> See, Mary, what she says is what could have been. My brother would still be alive if you were here. It's a forward sadness. What am I supposed to do now, God? What could have been? How can I face life now? How, I wasn't supposed to do this alone, but I am. What, what could have been? And then Mary cries. And Jesus cries with her. He meets her right where she is. That, is. that is such the key to the whole thing. Jesus knows what he's going to do. In just a few minutes, he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And yet, we get to watch Jesus cry with Mary. That is fascinating. That he would stop and go, I'm just going to cry with you. He knows that it doesn't matter. He knows that we do this all the time. That we are so into things going on right now in our world. And Jesus and God, they're up there. They're going, you know, that's really not that important. But okay, I'll be with you in that. Ultimately, you're going to be with me in heaven. And it's going to be so awesome. But I'm with you with what you're facing right now. That's incredible. There's no God, psychic. There's nothing like that in this world. There's no other religion like that. Where God is like, this isn't going to matter in just a few minutes when I raise this guy from the dead. But that's coming. I'm with you. And I'm with you right now with what you're facing. That's incredible. I do funerals a lot. And a lot of times I don't even know the person. I don't know anyone in the room. I'm just doing the funeral. And when the crowd, uh, they've told me what to say. They've told me about the person. And so I'm like up there doing it. And they start crying because they know the person. It still gets me. I start crying. I'm like, I don't even know this person. But because of your pain and what I feel in the room, I have to just, there's something that g it gets me. And I begin to cry as well. Sometimes. And then I'll do a funeral of someone I know, someone I knew for a long time. And look out, that's when the water works. I, I, I barely can do some kind of cohesive message. Like you shouldn't have me do your funeral because it's just like I, I can't even get through it, right? It's weird that I would say that, right? <laughs> but imagine, imagine the creator of the person. Like I just knew the person but the creator, the one that designed them in every way. Imagine that person and how they feel in that moment and how they cry in that moment. That's what we see with the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. I've had pain in my life, um, things that have hurt me inside and out. People have hurt me. People have let me down. I've gone through some stuff, but I don't really cry over it much because it's just kind of part of life. I just, it's just, it's just the way it is. It's sin. There's, you know, but when my kids are hurting and my kids are going through something, there's this shift that happens into me where now I really do care. 
and I cry with them. I hold them. I want to solve the problem. Like it just matters so much more to me. Or if my wife's hurting, my family's hurting. It means so much more. And what we're seeing here is a God that responds just like that. People, people are, are, are awful to God. But when they're awful to his kids, he's much more responsive. And he weeps and he's there holding them through it. He cries when we cry. He's saying, I'm here in the good and I'm here in the bad. I'm here in the joy and I'm here in the pain. And then we see very judgmental people around this moment going, you know, if he's going to cry about it, why didn't he just show up sooner? Why didn't he just show up and heal him? He's sitting here crying with Mary. That literally is the verses that are happening there, which gets us to person number three, Jesus. Notice verse five of chapter 11. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, hear this, he stayed where he was two more days. Now that is a strange, strange verse. When he hears Lazarus is sick, he stays. Why? Because he loved them. Surprise, Miracle 7 is about love. They're all about love. The Greek word being used here is agape love. It's a divine love. And he loves them so much in a divine way, very important, in a divine way that he doesn't go. He waits two more days. Why does he do that? Because there is a traditional Jewish belief that the soul is still in the person for three days. And there's a chance in those three days, that's why they had all these people come and pray and pray and pray, is a chance in those three days that that soul could return and the person could still be alive. So I'm going to ask you, church, how many days do you think Jesus waits before he shows up? Take a guess. Well, you just put on the screen. The next service, you've got to wait. <laughs> the answer is four days. All right? So God is late. Four days. Why? Because he loved them. He decided to show them something greater. He's already done healing. We just went through a bunch of his healing ones. Why do healing again? Because he loved them, he wants to show them something so much greater. And he wants to go and attack this, this belief that somehow that only the soul, only the Jewish belief is that the soul is only there for three days. He wants to show that he's the conqueror of death. He's going to leave no doubt that he is bigger than even death. That's what he does. He's foreshadowing his power over death. He tells Martha, the doer, I am the resurrection. She needed to hear that. She needed to know that he has a purpose of why he's doing what he's doing because she's a doer and she needs to hear that. He tells Martha nothing. He just cries with her because that's what she needed. She needed to feel that he is with her in this moment. They both came to Jesus openly. They were honest. They were very honest with their pain, but they also were very honest that I still have faith and I still believe even beyond this moment. So what does he do? He meets them where they are. We're so concerned with God answering our prayers a certain way. We're so concerned with miracles and how the world should be. And he cares far more about our soul, our eternal soul. And he wants you to know all this stuff is temporary. And what matters is your soul that's within you, not the way the world believes. Let me show you. I'm going to wait four days. I'm going to show you. Not the way that the world believes. My love is deeper and I care about your soul. As we get to miracle eight, guess what? It's about love. 
his love for you. Everyone was so confused by the cross. They couldn't understand why the king would be going to the cross. They couldn't understand why this would be happening this way. They expected a different savior. They expected a different king. And because of his love, he moved past all their expectations, all the ways they wanted him to be. Because he loved them, he said, here's what you actually need. Can you believe that God is late because he loves you? Is not answering because he loves you? Can you believe that he has something else he may be doing? He may be telling you to wait. He may be saying no altogether. He may have something else going on that's far different than what we think. Can you believe in this God and love him the same way he loves you? The fourth character, this will be the last one, is the disciples. They're part of this story too. And they're an interesting part of the story. Verse seven, and then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you are going back. It's actually a good question. They just tried to kill you there. And are you sure that's really where we should be going right now? You see, the disciples have this fear of death, probably like a lot of us do, this fear of death and that we need to be very careful how we maneuver through this world because death is a real thing. So Jesus is going to show them this fear that you have. It's not needed. I am the conqueror of death I am bigger than this moment. And they hear this message because they all go from this point after this is all over, after all the miracles are done, they travel around the world sharing this message because they finally get it. But in this moment, they still had to understand, oh, God is bigger. They're not there yet. So they come to this part of the story in fear and they have to discover that Jesus is bigger than their fear. And some of us are in this story. Some of us are in this moment. We're in this moment where we live in fear. I mean, we're in a weird time in our world, right? And we're living, a lot of us are living with this fear. When God says, you know I'm bigger, right? You know I'm bigger. I conquered death. Can I tell you? about Lazarus? Can I show you a miracle that says even death, I'm bigger. That is what we see with the disciples. Verse 14, so then he told them plainly, hey, Lazarus is dead and for your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that, remember that's what you circle in your Bible, so that you may believe. It wasn't just He wasn't late just for Martha, Mary. He's also late for them. One last miracle that I need to show you so that you will walk with strength and confidence knowing I am God. But let us go to him. And then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Thomas is hilarious. I'm not even sure if he's talking about Lazarus or Jesus. Let's go so we can die with Jesus or Lazarus. I don't know how. There's a multitude of ways to take this, and I was reading a lot about it. I just think Thomas is a guy who likes facts. Because we see Thomas a few times. The one that everyone knows is doubting Thomas. He's in the upper room. He's telling the disciples, not until I see the hands and see the scars. And then Jesus shows up and goes, Thomas, come check it out. And we kind of see that moment as, oh, Thomas got burned because Jesus says, you know, you should be without this. But I don't see it that way. Because in this moment, what is Thomas saying? Okay, We're going to die. Let's go. Thomas is a faith guy. He actually is very much faith-driven. He's just also a facts guy. And I think there's a few of these people as well in this room. I just want to see some facts. And here's what's crazy. Jesus meets him where he is. In that upper room, he doesn't just go in there and go, Thomas, man. No, he says, come over. And he allows him to have the facts that he needs. Now understand, Thomas approached it in faith. He's willing to die for Jesus. Okay? So you can't just say, I'll have, I need facts before I'm going to bliss. Thomas is all in. But when he needed the facts, 
Jesus meets him where he is. This story is just over and over, people being met right where they are out of a love that he wants you to feel that so much more that he loves you. And speaking of love and speaking of meeting someone where they are, let's get to Lazarus, verse 43. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. He beats death. We close, why why does he do this? He does it out of his love for them and his love for us. He wants you to know how much he loves us. And the question we have to answer is, can we praise him not for what he does for us, but just because of who he is? No matter which part of the story that represented you, can you take it in? And I'm in and I love you. And some of you in this room, you might need to do that for the very first time. In my Bible, the next title, because it has titles for some reason, it says the plot to kill Jesus. The very next title, right after that verse, maybe yours says it too. It says the plot to kill Jesus. He raises someone from the dead and they decide, okay, we got to kill this guy. It doesn't even make sense. He just raised someone from the dead, right? He conquers death, and your, your response is, oh, we should kill him. That's the Pharisees. His life, Lazarus, leads to death for Jesus. But Jesus' death leads to life for us. Your God loves you so much more than we could ever imagine. In Romans 3.23, he said, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He knows who you are. He knows what you've done. You can move past that now because he says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The gift, it's a gift. And Romans 10, 9 says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you know this God? after miracle after miracle to show how much he loves you. Do you know him? If you don't, now is the time.